So I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak today. I'm going to talk about um, some operational, um, some applications of operational models with constitutive activity. So um, initially I'll talk briefly about the allosteric two state model. Uh, then I'll move on to the inclusion of constitutive activity in the operational model and the implications that inclusion of um, constitutive constitutive activity has for the measurement of pharmacological properties um, and also how it leads to um, an alternative method for quantifying the um, bias of, of ligands. And then I'm going to change um, tack quite dramatically and um, talk briefly about some work we did um, using pharmacological uh, analytical pharmacological methods derived from these models um, to um, determine the number of binding sites on CC chemokine receptor 4. So, um, the allosteric two-state model really arose out of an interest I had in um, understanding the functional impacts of allosteric modulators. Um, and the model is derived essentially by fusing the two-state model of receptor activation with the um, ternary complex model of allosteric modu modulation. When you merge the two and complete the scheme, that um, results in this model, um, and we can analyze um, it mathematically and um, compare its predictions with experimental observations. And so um, a couple of the interesting uh, results that came out of that were um, an ability to um, provide a rationale for the effects of um, this allosteric modulator of um, mglur one um, where we saw um, where experimentally the compound inhibits the maximal response to glutamate without changing its potency and it also has no effect on um, tritiated glutamate binding. Um, and you achieve this in the allosteric two-state model by um, in ascribing to the allosteric modulator negative activation cooperativity coupled with positive binding cooperativity. The negative activation cooperativity results in a depression of the maximal response, but also a rightward shift in the potency, and you have to compensate that with positive binding cooperativity in order to show no impact on potency and no impact on binding. Also, um, the activation cooperativity um, parameter leads to a natural um, a natural description of coagonism as essentially just positive um, activation binding cooperativity between two um, what could be neutral antagonists as shown here and um, here in the data on um, NMDA receptors um, where this phenomenon has been well described in the requirement of the presence of glycine as well as NMDA in order to achieve a uh, activation of the NMDA receptors. Um, so moving on to the operational model and inclusion of um, constitutive activity. Operational models are common models used in, in pharmacological analysis and the basic principle of those models is that you can um, model the um, a concentration response curve and in this case a rectangular hyperbolic concentration response curve by um, assuming the form of the binding curve, and for GPCRs, for agonists, this is um, going to be described straightforwardly by the Hill-Langmuir equation. Um, and then in accounting for all of the signal transduction processes in a simple mathematical function that we call the transducer function. And if binding and concentration response curve are both rectangular hyperbole, then the transducer function also turns out to be a rectangular hyperbola. Um, and we can then relate the intrinsic activity and potency of the agonist in the functional assay with its efficacy and um, its binding affinity and use the model to analyze those properties of an agonist in appropriately designed experiments. So 
Um, in the classic operational model derived by Black and Leff, um, only agonist receptor complexes can induce a response. So the sort of obvious way of incorporating constitutive activity into an operational model then is to allow the receptor in the absence of a ligand to induce a response. That's essentially the definition of constitutive activity. And then in the to allow um, ligands to modulate that activity, we postulate that um, ligand receptor complexes simply induce a different stimulus, degree of stimulus from free receptors. And we encapsulate that difference in this parameter epsilon. Um, and so for an agonist, epsilon is greater than one, and you see a greater response from induced by agonist receptor complexes than free receptors. And this um, parameter epsilon is actually formally identical to um, the um, definition of um, intrinsic efficacy um, proposed by in his work in the 1950s and 1960s. Um, and in fact, then this model um, suggests that we can measure the intrinsic efficacy of ligands um, independently of coupling efficiency, which is something that's not possible um, in the black and left model where the efficacy parameter includes both of these um, components. And so the immediate thing that we then ask is, well, we derived a model. Can we use that to analyze experimental data and derive pharmacological parameters? And the answer to that question is yes, this model is identifiable with an appropriate experimental design. Um, essentially, um, by varying, using the sort of standard, if you like, pharmacological approach of varying the receptor density, that will vary the level of constitutive activities that you can measure and the response to the ligand. And with a suitable set of data and the ability to measure um, response in the system which is independent of the receptor of interest, that allows us to quantify um, all of the parameters in the model and therefore to measure the affinity and the intrinsic efficacy of agonists in this model. We note quickly that if there is no constitutive activity, this model simplifies back to the original operational model. Um, but anyway, this gives us a way of measuring intrinsic efficacy from concentration response curves, which is something which hadn't um, previously been possible. Um, and that ability to measure intrinsic act, uh, efficacy also provides a, a, a method of measuring absolute ligand bias in that um, if you have two signaling pathways that you are um, measuring responses down, both exhibit constitutive activity. Um, you can measure intrinsic efficacy and the ratio of the intrinsic efficacies is then a valid method of measure of absolute bias. Um, in the operational model um, from black and left and methods that are derived from that model, it's necessary to um, determine bias relative to a standard because there's no way of um, independently accounting for differences in signal amplification using an operational model, whereas the um, Slack and Hall model, um, including constitutive activity, measures the coupling efficiency of the system independently of that intrinsic activity, intrinsic efficacy rather. Um, so now moving on to um, CCR4, um, we were developing inhibitors of CCR4 as um, potential treatments for asthma. And so we were addressing the usual questions um, that, uh, that come up in lead optimization campaigns. Are the um, inhibitors competitive with the endogenous agonists? Um, and do those um, antagonists bind to um, a common binding site with other antagonist structural classes, or do they bind to distinct sites? Um, there had already been 
some a proposal that there was an allosteric um, inhibitory site or an allosteric modulatory site on CCR4 um, from work performed by AstraZeneca, who showed that their compound series um, represented by this compound, compound seven, um, in the paper that we published, um, bound to a binding site that was accessible from the cytosolic face of CCR4, um, whereas this compound from um, BMS didn't bind to that site, but the binding site, but no further details of that binding site were presented, so it was unclear whether this uh, molecule competed with the chemokines or was binding to a distinct site. So um, the question from the project was, are our compounds binding to that intracellular site or to a distinct binding site? Um, and we chose to try and address this using a, a combined dose ratios approach, because essentially um, this was the experimental design that we were using to determine the affinity um, of the antagonists um, at the time. And so um, it's relatively straightforward then to modify the experimental design to look for um, the effects of combinations of antagonists. So if we have two antagonists and they both cause rightward shifts in the concentration response curve, what happens if we mix the two together? Where does that curve lie? Um, Peyton and Rang had already um, described the result for two competitive antagonists and so the concentration ratio caused by two competitive antagonists added simultaneously um, to a system is essentially equal to the sum of the dose ratios that those antagonists cause individually minus one. Um, Christopoulos and Mitchelson had also um, demonstrated for uh, the interaction between a competitive antagonist and a surmountable allosteric modulator, allosteric antagonist, um, that if you combine those compounds, the effect is actually multiplicative. Um, in the absence of cooperativity between these two ligands, the effect is actually exactly, the, should ex be exactly the product of the individual dose ratios and any cooperativity between these ligands then tunes that product down or up depending on whether it's negative or positive cooperativity. So we were interested in potentially interactions of um, allosteric modulators at distinct allosteric regulatory sites um, or at the same allosteric site and that those two systems hadn't been considered. So um, we analysed these two models um, competing allosteric modulators or modulators binding to distinct sites um, and with certain simplifying assumptions derived these relationships um, I should say simplifying assumptions that our data conformed to um, so for modulators that compete at the same allosteric site um, the dose ratio of the combination must be less than or occasionally equal to the individual dose ratios. It can never be greater than the sum of the individual dose ratios. Whereas if the modulators don't compete with each other, bind to distinct sites, then the dose ratio, to be fair, can take any value, but um, must, um, well, without very strong negative cooperativity between the two ligands should be more than the sum of the individual dose ratio. So this provides us with criteria to distinguish between ligands that bind to um, the same site or distinct sites. Um, and so if we then look at some um, data, here is a, an ONO compound and here an AstraZeneca, comp the AstraZeneca compound I showed before. Both compounds individually cause parallel um, surmountable rightward shifts of the response to um, CCL17 in um, primary T cell um, effactin um, polymerization experiments, uh, actin polymerization assays rather. Um, when we combine those two antagonists, so add them both at the same concentrations, um, 
this is the curve, the effect that results um, clearly much greater than the sum of the individual dose ratios, suggesting that these antagonists are binding to distinct binding sites. Um, this depression of the maximal response is also potentially consistent with them binding to distinct sites. Um, we profiled our own compounds and a number of other standards from the literature um, and using compounds one and seven then as representatives of two distinct binding sites and those compounds essentially partitioned into two classes, those which compete with compound one and those which compete with compound seven and so presumably bind to this intracellular binding site. So the question is then whether site one is actually the chemokine binding site or whether it's a distinct allosteric modulatory site. Um, we were fortunate with CCR4 in having um, two um, available um, antagonist chemokines at that receptor. So this truncated version of CCL competitive antagonist of CCR4 as is CCL11. If we combine CCL 22, 3 to 69 and compound one, we see again super additive concentration ratios, dose ratios, um, indicating that these are binding to distinct sites. So compound one is not then presumably binding to the chemokine binding site. Whereas if we, for the, a control, look at the interaction CCL22 and CCL11, we see a sub additive interaction in the green curve here, indicating at least that there's no evidence that they bind to distinct site and are more likely to be competing with each other and presumably with the chemokines. Um, so essentially that suggests that we have three ligand binding sites on CCR4, the chemokine binding site itself, and then site one, which was a site which bound um, lipophilic amines and site to the um, site reported by AstraZeneca that binds to aryl sulfonamides. And so we were able to um, essentially help our medicinal chemists by demonstrating that there were two binding sites and therefore potentially two sources of distinct substructure activity relationships on CCR4 and two binding sites to target, if you like, therapeutically. Um, I should also say that um, radioligand binding studies were consistent with this hypothesis. We labelled representatives of the two compound classes. Um, I won't um, dwell on the summary, but move on to the acknowledgements. Um, Rob Slack and Linda Russell um, performed um, the chemokine binding assays, um, chemokine receptor binding assays. Kate and uh, Giovanna were sandwich students who performed some of the um, T cell um, antagonist interaction studies along with Sally Rumley and myself. And more than you are, and Ashley um, were our molecular biologists and generated the um, CCR4 stable cell lines for the project. Um, Simon Hodgson was the project leader, Nick Barson, our structural biologist and computational chemist. I should also acknowledge the chemistry team for synthesizing the reagents. Jesus Geraldo um, collaborated with me on the um, work um, measure uh, to look at the use of the Slack and Hall model for measuring um, ligand bias. And I would also like to thank Jane Denier, Richard Knowles, Helen Connor, and Heather Giles, former line managers of mine at GSK, for supporting my um, work on um, receptor theory um, during my career. So thank you.